Okay, well the last uh, topic, management and mitigation, was a new topic added from last year. Um, and so I wanted to kind of go through some of the options. Some of these make sense, some of them are kind of put together. Again, they're from a lot of, uh, you know, personal experiences with lakes, etc. Bev, when she talked about her last slide, talked about developing a manual for management and mitigation. Um, we may, I may or may not be involved in that a bit, but I did a bit of that for la last year for um, East Bay Parks, and so some of that I put into this little talk as well. So, and and this uh, battery went dead. I think it's telling us the day is getting on. So I'm just going to be talking without the uh, microphone. Well, taxonomy, monitoring, sample and detection all inform the process of setting HAB advisories, guidance, advisory guidance, management, and mitigation. So all of the topics have covered to now, taxonomy, monitoring, sampling, detection. There's the tool, there's the information you have to go about uh, doing the advisories and the management and mitigation. So now what I wanted like to do is to, okay, what options do you have for management and mitigation, basically? Um, we've already seen this a couple places, so I don't need to leave it out, but this is a summary of those toxins that we want to be managing and mitigating, along with the blooms that are producing them. The, uh, the EPA, just in 2015, again, set these two advisories for 10-day um, drinking water advisories for microcystins and cylindrospermopsin. So there's another you know, bit of information out there that you got that information on how you're going to manage and mitigate it. Uh, the flow charts that have been set up look, can look like this. In this particular case, uh, this is the one that Oregon did based on their CDC uh, five-year program. And then Bev showed you um, so again, this is the kind of information you're looking at to then inform your management and mitigation. Um, I'm having trouble reading that, so I'm going to have to go here. Uh, <clears throat> so these are example monitoring strategies simplified from the WHO guidelines and along with, with Oregon. So these are some of the numbers. These are the locations, and these are the considerations, and the type and the frequency uh, for sampling and uh, informing public information and outreach. So again, that's the kind of information that you have. And finally, this is what the EPA likes to do. They like a sort of a, a traffic light approach to setting these low level, medium level, and high levels, very similar to what Beverly just showed you for, for Florida, or for California. Um, an extreme example, I've shown you an overhead satellite photo of Lake Tai or Tai Wu in China. Around 2007, this lake, as I said, switched from uh, being eutrophic to hyper-eutrophic. It's uh, about a thousand square mile natural lake, massive bloom of microcystis, and in this case, slow, you know, shut down the drinking water for about five million customers. Uh, this is what you want to avoid, isn't it? This is, the, this is why we would approach management and mitigation. China is apparently putting billions of dollars into the program for cleanup. Um, I've seen some of the efforts. Some of the efforts are not working very well. They're not coordinated, and that's the problem. Um, it's nice that when you set your programs here in California, you coordinate. And my ex example being, in the lake case of Tai Wu, they spent several million dollars dredging the lake, and then they hauled the spoils up on the hillsides above the lake and dumped them. <laughs> And now they're back in the lake. So, um, you know, again, extreme examples, but on the other hand, 
you need to you need to take these into consideration. The other interesting um, thing with China, I think, which is kind of points to the efforts worldwide. Uh, I was at a meeting in China, a World Lakes conference, about five or six years ago, and uh, they had the Minister of Environment for China gave an opening address. And uh, of course, it was simultaneous translation. But basically, what he said was that China was not so worried about the environment, that they were worried about economic development. And they pointed to what Europe did with air pollution and what the U.S. has done with air water pollution and said that, you know, when it gets bad enough, we'll just spend the money and we'll fix it. We're not going to worry about it. And of course, you can see what the consequence of that is in terms of uh, air and water pollution in China. So now they're going to, you know, hire scientists and engineers and fix it, maybe. Well, management really means using a risk management framework. Mitigation is really choosing what your options are, hopefully, to prevent. And they would be things like, uh, you know, as simple as choosing which point of water extraction from the water treatment plant to avoid taking in cells and toxin. Choosing optimum water treatment techniques and even choosing the right algae site to treat your lake. You know, those come down to mitigation, but I like to expand the term mitigation to what do you do before you have the bloom that you want to manage and mitigate. Uh, that mitigation really means prevention, and it's not just prevention most immediate of what you draw into your water treatment plant, but mitigation means what do I do so that I don't have those blooms that I have to worry about in the first place. Uh, in case you hadn't thought about this, and I think most of you had, but when it comes to trophic indexes and trophic classes for lakes, um, we haven't had the term hypereutrophic that long. Uh, when I took limnology a few years ago, all we had was oligotrophic, mesotrophic, and eutrophic. But now we've defined a uh, trophic index and chlorophyll numbers and phosphorus numbers and secchi dicks and uh, disc depths and, and uh, created this new classification of, of hypereutrophic. So a, a trophic index of 70 to 100, chlorophylls 56 to 155, phosphorus 96 to 380, and a uh, secchi disc of only about a half a meter or a quarter of a meter even. Uh, defines uh, a hyper-eutrophic lake. And as we know, we now have quite a number of them and increasing all the time to deal with. Effective management can prevent or minimize blooms, and along with effective management, effective mitigation too. There are really three approaches to uh, management and mitigation. Physical controls, where you physically manipulate uh, lake intake locations, depth, aerators, mechanical mixers, things like that. Uh, biological controls would be manipulation of the lake ecology to favor cyanobacteria grazers. That's kind of like a top-down approach. And increased competition for nutrients or locking up nutrients, which might be considered your bottom-up controls. And then chemical controls, and the chemical controls you hope you don't have to do if you do proper physical, biological, etc. So chemical controls would be things like phosphorus treatments, lime, alum, aluminum sulfates, uh, sorry, lime, aluminum sulfate or alum, uh, ferric chloride, and even clay particles. There's quite a bit of discussion now using particular kind of clays that have a charge that actually grab and bind cells, flocculate them, and carry them out of the photosynthetic water column. So those would, again, be examples of your chemical controls. Uh, algicides, as has been discussed, we like to avoid, but we do have them. Copper sulfates, the old ones, um, make, make, really make more problems than they solve. Uh, other oxidants, like hydrogen peroxide, though, are used. Um, an interesting situation that I, uh, is an example of what happens when you attempt to use algicides. 
Um, I worked on large drinking water reservoirs in Brazil, especially in Sao Paulo, which of course is about a 20 million population city. Unfortunately, many of their reservoirs are located in the watersheds of favelas or slums, and so there's, those areas have no water treatment and have no water running water to begin with. So they're highly eutrophic, and they were in the process of using an awful lot of copper sulfate. And within a few years, the algae became completely passive resistant uh, copper sulfate. It didn't matter how much you put in there. So they, when I was there, probably 10, 15 years ago now, they were actually actively using hydrogen peroxide. They had barges where they sprayed the reservoir with hydrogen peroxide. And it wasn't very long, in fact, just within a few months that they had cyanobacteria resistant to hydrogen peroxide. So these are the problems with chemical control. Uh, you have to be quite selective and quite picky, just like you approach pesticide use and herbicide use. You have to be picky and selective, or you simply create more problems than you solve. So let's... Um, Maybe go through these things. Yep. Were, the, were those reservoirs being used for um, drinking water? Yeah, these were the, the drinking water reservoirs, right. So the poor population, were they just grabbing water? Did they actually have treat, was there treatment going on? Well, they carried water, yeah. Or they truck water into these favelas. So they buy water from trucks, which come from the same reservoir that they're living in usually. Yeah, but they weren't treating it or anything probably for drinking for water. Oh, well, no, the water, they would buy water, potable water, yes. Okay. So the reservoir water was going through a treatment plant, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, before I get started, I just wanted to make this statement. Uh, this is from a paper by Hans Perl in 2011. He's doing a lot of the nutrient management work on Taiwu in China. And uh, he's of the opinion that nitrogen and phosphorus both need to be controlled. If you're not familiar, we've kind of gotten through this, you know, which is more important, nitrogen or phosphorus? And uh, we kind of, unlike Gary now, they're pointing to phosphorus and saying, okay, well, let's fix phosphorus and we'll fix the situation. But his work on, on uh, Taiwu indicates that Based on nutrient cycling studies, this is the red at the bottom, uh, combined with nitrogen input estimates indicate that microcystis <coughs> thrives on both newly supplied and previously loaded nitrogen sources to maintain its dominance. Denitrification did not relieve the lake of excessive nitrogen inputs. Results point to the need to reduce <coughs> both nitrogen and phosphorus for long-term eutrophication and cyanobacterial bloom control. So with that sort of in mind, um, let's move on. The management tools, um, at least the, as I perceive them and seeing them used and sort of summarizing them, are, are kind of go into these four categories. <coughs> Restricting nutrient, both nitrogen and phosphorus availability. Reducing light availability. Reducing water temperature. And preventing quiescent uh, stagnant waters. And there are subcategories to these as well, so let's break them apart and look at them individually. Restricting nutrient availability, maybe through, and this of course is the one that I advocate, assuming you can, <laughs> is total watershed management. Uh, allows you to point source control, wastewater discharges and selective inflows, uh, it allows you to handle non-point source control of agriculture runoff and stormwater runoff. That's the optimum. That's what we all like to strive to be able to do. But we can't always do that. You know, Portland, for example, it's Bull Run. They own the watershed. It's the slopes of Mount Hood. So it's <laughs> they've got a situation that's nice. Down here or in other places, you don't own the watershed. You can't manage it. You can't decide what to do with it. So maybe that doesn't work so well. But the advantages of total watershed is that I think is that you can involve the community and use them to help educate the whole understanding of nutrient enrichment. Well, disadvantages, you know, it takes a long time, high costs. Um, it's very difficult to control non-point, all of it. 
but uh, this is your this is what we'd like to strive for. The second component of restricting nutrient availability is phosphorus inactivation via chemical precipitation. And we know that we have available things like alum has been used quite a bit, farm ponds and drinking water supplies and on, um, there are also iron compounds and calcium compounds and synthetic polymers. And this last one I bring up, Foslock, um, I think has some promise. Uh, if you've ever used alum or aluminum sulfate, you know that you have to use an awful lot. Foslock has the advantage. This is a lanthanum modified clay, and it was developed in Australia by the uh, CSIRO people, their Science Industrial Research Group. And it's, uh, it's available now in this, the US. There's a, at least one distributor that sells it in Eastern California. The advantage is that it, it's very much better at binding phosphorus on a molecule per basis. And it also, therefore, requires much less. So where it would take pounds to hundreds of pounds of, of alum, you might get away with grams, literally. Um, of course, it costs a lot costs more, too. But I think that has advantage in terms of phosphorus inactivation and also for longer term inactivation. The advantages of phosphorus inactivation binds the phosphorus, inhibits its release from the sediment, and therefore makes it unavailable to grow algae. The disadvantages, um, if you've got external loading, then you've sort of lost you know, any advantage of locking up what's there because you're constantly putting new materials in. And in the case with aluminum materials, aluminum toxicity, of course, the alum. Um, this was pointed out, some work was, you know, some situations in Australia where they treated uh, reservoirs with aluminum sulfate and the sheep are very sensitive to aluminum it turns out so it killed all the sheep <laughs> so you have to again take these things into consideration as near as i can tell the the environment the ecology ecotoxicology studies i've seen done with foslock indicate that it's fairly uh, passive it doesn't um, doesn't kill invertebrates and fish anyway well, is that a third. Use, sorry. Is that a proof of use in California? That was it. Pardon? Oh, it's proof of use in California. Yeah. Was it? yeah. C Pro. Huh? C Pro. C Pro. Yeah, that's that's right. C Pro carries a bit of a distributor. Yeah. Is it Foslock or alum that becomes toxic at certain pHs? That sorry becomes toxic at certain pHs. That would be the alum. Okay. Yeah. So Foslock doesn't have that issue. No. Okay. Okay, a third approach, hypolimetic oxygenation. Well, as you, you know, this is, a, this is an approach to restricting nutrient availability by oxygenating those bottom sediments and helps lower, P, um, helps lower the phosphorus and other metals like manganese and iron as well, and essentially improves fish habitat. Um, the disadvantages with the deep water uh, aeration is that high external nutrient inputs, rising bubbles, transport nitrogen and phosphorus to the surface water. So um, while you do it, you are improving the overall water quality, you can also release more nitrogen and phosphorus into the water. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about um, what size or type of water body you would recommend the hypolimetic oxygenation in and does it, does it actually reduce the nutrient load in the sediment? Is it, is it a long-term improvement of load or is it, is it just a temporary control? Well, it's a continuous improvement, so you have to continuously use it. Um, you can use them with fairly size, you know, size of a lake shaft, but a lot of aeration. Uh, there's a lake, I think it's around two or three miles long, in the Oregon coast called D Lake at Lincoln City, and they're putting in a, a big aeration system for hypomimetic aeration to control microcystis blooms. Um, so, again, you have to have a good engineer design a good system and size it to the, to the lake. And of course, you have you have energy inputs in the form of you know, aerators and pumps and things like that too. Okay, those three. Um, another that's 
not used a lot, but is possible, is hypolimetic withdrawal, where you literally are pulling out those bottom sediment nutrients. And, um, you know, the advantage is that you can quickly transport nutrients out of the lake, increase the dissolved oxygen in bottom waters. Um, this is used maybe not specifically for that reason, but for other reasons. Um, Trinity Lake and uh, Trinity River, you know, use hypolimetic drawdowns to maintain flows, but also as a water quality treatment as well. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, that presumes you have a plug that you can pull up too, so it's only on the, you know, reservoirs works best. And, of course, you need lots of water. And the politics up there is that um, <clears throat> when you draw down the water out of Trinity Lake, then you've got people complaining that they can't vote and they can't do their water activities and sports and things like that, too. So. Well, anyway, those are four ways that you can affect um, nutrients. And then, finally, dredging. Uh, dredging is very effective. Dredging is expensive. It's the physical removal of those nutrient-rich sediments, enlarging the storage capacity of the water body as well. Disadvantages, it tends to impair water quality because as you're mixing things up. And what are you going to do with those disposed dredge materials? Hopefully you don't put them where they come back into the lake, right? And reduce those benthic, reduces benthic biodiversity because you're taking biologicals out. Um, and of course, if you have external inputs, it comes back again. So these smaller lakes in East Bay, when we were up there, and Beverly mentioned, um, I think dredging would be a great approach for any of those lakes, just because they're small enough, they're old enough. Many of them are reservoirs, drinking water reservoirs for Oakland, like Temescal. And uh, you know, you simply had 100 years of accumulated sediment. Get it out. You got another 100 years of working with the water itself, but it's also the most expensive approach in selling, you know, selling the commission to fund that may not work as well as much as you'd like. But I think dredging is, is a very good, especially for our contrived, uh, constructed water systems that we often deal with now. A final one that has uh, an interesting application, barley straw. Uh, for bacteria. Uh, this is used in Australia. It's used probably a hundred years ago and I learned about it. Uh, barley in particular, when it degrades in a water body, it tends to release certain tannins and compounds, phenols maybe, as bacteria break down the straw that's actually algocidal to cyanobacteria and works very well. Of course, it's a little unsightly to have bales of straw around your swimming area. But uh, for small ponds and, and you know, cattle, you know, animal access and things like that, where it's not so much for recreation, uh, is, is a good idea. You're also adding nutrients. But you're adding nutrients, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as an example of why it at least makes sense to work, here's an example. There's a lake in. Uh, in north, northwestern Ohio. It's a constructed lake uh, built as, actually as part of the Ohio Canal system back in the 1800s. And of course when that was abandoned it became a, re a recreational lake. And uh, so the last 20 years it's gone hyper eutrophic. It's also a drinking water supply for a couple of small cities. Uh, it's gotten so bad that, that my actual recommendation was to fill in the lake and create a park, but um, that's not something they want to consider because that attracts too much, too much income from recreation. In fact, in Ohio, you have very few lakes that are actually good for recreation purposes. Ohio doesn't have as many lakes, except Lake Erie, I guess. But one of the approaches was to get student involvement in uh, community involvement and actually place these straw bales and it cleared up the water. Uh, it works. <laughs> you know, you have to do that every couple of years and you've got the problem of straw bales. But notice what they've done. They've taken the bales and they've bundled them into long sort of tube things so that they can lay them along the edge of the, in this case they were 
laying them along the edges of streams, the inputs to the lake. So not something I recommend, but it's there. Second, reducing light availability. Well, that's, as you might expect, that's a little difficult to do in a big reservoir or big lake of any kind, but it works pretty well for smaller, especially holding reservoirs for drinking water supplies. Uh, but it's not just covering that water body, it's also using chemical colorants and dyes. And I don't know how popular it is here, but in the Midwest, you can start driving through Iowa, and Kansas, and uh, uh, Ohio, and uh, many, many people have dugouts in their backyard. This is their aquatic recreation. And to maintain it looking like an aquatic thing you can enjoy, they actually put a lot of colored dyes, blue in particular. And of course, that gives you, you know, marine, nice looking blue water. And they do. They will um, shade and inhibit and prevent algae from growing. And the ones that are used that are, tend to be biodegradable and non-toxic to fish and invertebrates too. But you know, they're an artificial system. They're not worried about maintaining biological diversity unless it's, you know, to grow fish for fishing. Well, disadvantages reduces the aquatic productivity. Uh, many cyanobacteria, of course, grow and float, so they can float on the top anyway. But it is, it is a, uh, a possibility. And then, of course, covering of, of reservoirs. I've seen quite a few communities now go to literally covering their, their holding reservoirs uh, to reduce this. And of course, along with that, you're going to have to put in more aerators because you, you don't want to go anaerobic in your system and start getting taste and odor issues. But uh, they do work. And again, you can use natural clays, too, to create turbidity issues and reduce light. Uh, third, reducing water temperature. Well, that's pretty tough to do, so we just kind of skipped that. There's really no practical way. And of course, with uh, global warming or climate changes, it's becoming even more difficult to uh, manage any kind of water temperature. Yep. Actually, before you skip it, one of the Efforts that a lot of the regions here use is to increase natural shading to control oh, temperature. Yeah. And I'm wondering, yeah, I just wanted to make sure you thought that it was worth it. I mean, it's yeah, in fact, in one of my in my list for tennis call, I was going to list that. I mean, you know, if you have a park and you have a situation, actually increase, you're right, increase in shading with the uh, streamside or lakeside. Uh, growth of vegetation works very well. Well, what about preventing quiescent and stagnant waters? Uh, the advantage is that it does not require nutrient control to be effective, so you can avoid chemis chemicals. Um, disadvantages, sometimes it's, you know, achieving sufficient circulation in large lakes is tough, but this is more of your you know, somehow we get, you know, how are we going to increase circulation or draw down or flow through? Most of it involves some kind of, of aeration system. Uh, so we talked about the whole lake destratification that we talked about for nutrient control, but this would also work to break up that stratification that the cyanobacteria like. So there could be aeration for whole lake destrat destratification. Uh, but just like before, it tends to promote internal nutrient loading, and unless you really design the system well, you um, have only a small area of influence, and so you prevent a bloom here, but it comes up over here and comes into your area anyway. But depending on what you are looking for, it can work. Uh, a newer source or form of circulation is this LDC, long distance circulation, just in the upper layers of the water system, roughly from the thermocline up. So you circulate only above the thermocline, which is where your cyanobacteria are, and you're disrupting them through motion, and uh, it, it impacts them fairly well. It also tends to enhance overall lake health. Um, disadvantages, you know, you, again, you have to design a system that covers the whole lake. 
Now, what I'm specifically thinking of here is, is a, uh, a system produced by SolarBee, a company that promotes these uh, circulation, where they have uh, solar panels which provide the power, and then the circulation is in the separate layers. And they were promoted a lot, and I think they've been tried a couple places here in California. And I know in particular in the Midwest and North Carolina, they were used on some fairly large <coughs> drinking water systems. Unfortunately, they haven't proven beyond the pilot stage to be that effective. And I know they're having troubles. Yes? So I'm going to give an example. Um, uh, on the, the tribe I work for, we had two shorelines. One shoreline where we have a solar bee in our marina, and then another shoreline, which is another marina the tribe owned, uh, where we did primarily aeration. So what we had was a water pump, and we were basically circulating lake water back into the bloom area manually. So that was hypolimnetic in one case and upper. Yes. Yeah. So the 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 I just have to say, after ten years of having a solar bee there, I, um, not only do we not see any increased dissolved oxygen um, in in the area where the um, the solar bee is, but we don't see. I mean, we have four different places within our marina where we're sampling, uh, and outside the marina where we're sampling the water quality, and we really just don't see a difference at all. It was a thirty thousand dollar piece of equipment that doesn't seem to make a bit of difference. Um, the aeration that we did, however, we, we were doing it throughout the summer and um, manually, and we also, had, we also had a diffuser sitting at the bottom that we bought through USA Blue Books, one of the ca Casco aerators, I believe, mm -hmm. are diffusers. And it works like a big, you know, like what you'd see in a fish tank. Sure. And, um, so uh, what we found is within um, the, the cyanotoxin levels that were and the blooms that were happening before we purchased these things seem to be less than you know after we um, started to operate both the manual aeration as well as having the diffuser in place. So our, our toxin levels were lower. Our blooms were. Uh, we could see other parts of the cove um, and other parts of the shoreline that we weren't doing these things uh, more socked in with blooms. There was more smell in those areas. And at the very least, we found it to be a way that um, you could manage the um, shoreline water quality and impact on the residences or, in our case, resorts that were uh, you know, in that area. So it's, it's something that... Um, so we, we pay uh, our tribal members to um, to do this work and puts money into the economy. It costs about the same as if you were to, uh, I mean, it, most places on Clear Lake don't do anything, you know, so at least it makes it livable and, um, and, it, um, and, and the toxin levels on our shoreline compared to nearby shorelines is a lot lower. Mm -hmm. So it's been, we've been doing that for several years now. Yeah, thank you. Well, Again, yeah, aeration can work, but this LDC, I, I just don't, can't quite get my head around why they aren't a little more effective than they are, but... Um, we have four of them in our lake, and they seem to work really well. Do they? In Valley Lake, yeah. Okay. I, feel I guess I've heard more negatives than positives, but... Mm -hmm. Can, I, can I ask how deep in Valley Lake is? Mm -hmm. Or how big it is? I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, if they're designed to work in wastewater treatment plants with a very controlled geometry that they're mixing. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I haven't, these are the first cases I've heard about with positive results, so it'd be great if you guys could publish these too. If you could share them, publish Company them. Anybody would like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, I'm sure you've all seen you know, storm retention ponds uh, with, with fountains in them, and of course, that's much the same thing. They, they're pretty to look at, and they provide some aeration, and they do improve the water quality. So, some other things that uh, you know, are useful for management. Um, of course, the algicides, which we've always already pointed to some of the issues with, chemical and physical, short-term benefit. Uh, another one under algicides, uh, well, sorry, algicides, chemical and physical, we've already discussed kind of the chemical 
But the physical algae side, um, sound waves, somebody usually asks about this, either the sonic uh, apparatus that you place in and they actually generate a sonic wave, which disrupts cells and prevents them from, you know, literally lyses them and prevents them from growing in the first place. Start, I got involved with these in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, some of the bigger reservoirs and rivers there they were tried out, plus that's where the company that was promoting them was, was started. Problem is, uh, at least what I concluded and what I've heard, is that again, they have a limited range, so just like aerators, you have to have lots of them. And they're harder to uh, maintenance because you have, you know, like any sort of sonic situation, you have trouble maintaining the right frequency that accomplishes what you want to accomplish. Um, but they do work. They do work. Um, yes? If they're lysing the cells, isn't that going to release the toxins? Yeah, but it also prevents them from growing in the first place. Okay. Uh, it, it does that more than it does uh, kill the cells. Uh, other possibility, biomanipulation. This could be a whole topic in itself, but when I was working in Australia on a project, they spent quite a bit of time and effort uh, taking significant sized reservoirs and lakes and manipulating the zooplankton and the fish to accommodate a essentially food chain that actually limited cyanobacteria. And properly done and wisely done works. Uh, so. You might remove fish and add fish back and encourage fish of a certain size at each eat a certain size zooplankton, which then frees up other zooplankton to feed on the algae. So you really have to understand the biology of your system. Uh, but it does work, and of course it takes a while. And they still use it on selected lakes, but again, you have to be able to have long-term management, uh, constantly looking at what what those, you know, the biology is so that you can maintain that. But it does work very well because we know that, um, you know, cyanobacteria tend to take over when we have upset the diversity of, of other things. Yes. So, so what are, what specifically are the grazes on cyanobacteria? Um, well, you know, Daphnia loves them uh, and other, you know, zooplankton. But different sized ones, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> All right. This is just a list again of kind of sum up. These are some of the algicides have been used and can be used for control of cyanobacteria. Copper sulfate, the old one, not used very much, but a lot of the copper analogs are still used. Um, Potassium permanganate, uh, various chlorine compounds, hydrogen peroxide, so on. Pack 27 is, help me, somebody. Sodium carbonate oxyhydrate. So that's a peroxide. Yeah. Well, as I said, uh, I was down at East Bay last year and I thought I'd throw in a slide that kind of summarized I looked at half a dozen lakes and we talked about its, you know, the situation, morphology and the depth and all this sort of thing. And kind of made a listing of what we thought would work best in kind of descending order. Uh, <clears throat> and, and this says in order of increasing importance, it really ought to say decreasing importance. I apologize. Uh, in most of the situations, I felt and we concluded that dredging would be the most effective. Lake aeration in those smaller lakes would work quite well. Other thing that I really liked, um, all of these lakes have small inputs, small creeks actually, very small creeks. And what you can do is expand the sediment retention ponds in those drainages. And by doing that, you actually plant, plant, put plant materials, native plants, aquatic plants in there to absorb the nutrients as they're coming in and holding water a bit longer before it flows through into the lake. Plus it improves the aesthetics, it looks nicer, it provides another little uh, spot for uh, recreational. So I was really encouraging um, some of these sediment retention ponds. They had a couple small ones, 
that didn't even look like retention ponds, but just sort of wide areas where there was more plant material. And in those areas, you actually were able to trap and retain and, and, uh, and reduce. And the blooms in the outflow from that area were, in fact, reduced. So providing those aquatic plants to absorb the nutrients and provide shade uh, in those set up retention ponds and elsewhere as well. Nutrient management, uh, there was suggestion that chemistry would help. Uh, you know, alum or phoslock to bind phosphorus, especially if you can't do the dredging. Uh, chemical treatment using hydrogen peroxide, the PAC-27, was something that they were going to, to use. And of course, they could do that because they owned the lake. If they didn't own the lake, they'd probably never get permission if it was a drinking water supply, for example. Uh, retain but manage lakeside plant riparian zones. One of the things that people complained about is we can't fish because we can't throw our lines in the lake. So they were wanting to take out the riparian zones completely so people had more access. My suggestion was that leave the riparian zones but um, open up a few more spots so you had literally fishing spots but leave most of the uh, plant, you know, the cattails and things like that. Uh, they also limit, you know, they reduce the uh, shoreline erosion too, along with everything else. And it's also possible to take out those plants at the end of the year and actually take nutrients out of the system. And I've seen this done elsewhere as well. And then, of course, if you had the resources, biomanipulation, because most of these lakes you put fish in for sport fishing. But pay attention to what fish and what else you do to apply a little bit of my biomanipulation. Uh, fish of certain size and species which select for zooplankton that graze on, on hab algae. And of course, that may be the lowest on the list of priorities, but this was kind of, this was Lake Temescal, but we, and we didn't always have the same listing order for the other lakes. They depended like Chabot and things like that, which were slightly different, deeper lakes and so on. But I would really encourage paying more attention to these management options. Um, again, just to summarize quickly, these are your main detection analysis methods. Um, the ELISAs we haven't talked about, I gave you that listing so that you can go and watch that little video. But sooner or later, I think most of you are going to get involved with ELISA kits. There are protein phosphatase inhibition assay too. One of the things about ELISA is that you may have high levels of microcystin, but what if those are analogs that have hardly any toxicity and really don't? We don't really care. I mean, microcystin is microcystin at this point. We don't want it. but. If you really had to make a decision about is this lake going to be opened or not, you may have to say, well, gee, we're going to, we're going to allow it. We better at least have microcystins that aren't very toxic. So the PPIA assay, and there's again a color metric assay kit available. In fact, a Braxis that sells the, the ELISA kits um, bought the company, a Spanish company that made the PPIA kits, and they're now sold by Abraxas as well. Um, I think it's telling me to be quiet. So I'm going to go ahead. HPLC was uh, as an effective analytical method, but really LCMS is better. So you combine liquid chromatography with mass spectroscopy. And then finally, these advanced genetic methods that are being developed. As uh, Beverly mentioned, there is this kit. Uh, the Australians, um, Brett and Island, who I worked with for a number of years and actually worked in my lab, is the one that developed the technology for those genetic probes. And then he's partnered with somebody who does the selling. So the reference to Mark is their partners in that, in that combined operation. And I, and I think those kinds of things will take off. I've been waiting. It's been you know 15 years since we isolated DNA from cyanobacteria and started playing with PCR but we're finally seeing some kits. The treatment effectiveness uh, is based on this AWWA white paper. I just thought we'd close with this. 
summarizing powdered activated carbon and which toxins they work better with and GAC, granular activated carbon, biological filtration and membrane processes and oxidation. So that's what these little slides for and you can have copies so you can look at those. Um, the kind of a takeaway message is that powdered activated carbon is really better than granular activated carbon and that the wood-based carbons are more effective at removing the toxins than uh, the uh, carbons made from um, coconut hulls, for example. So there are differences in your carbon. The, <clears throat> the effective uh, oxidation compounds, chemical compounds, chlorine, chloramines, dioxide, permanganate, here's another sort of summary of what they work best with. Um, and some references for water treatment. But my takeaway message really is um, mitigation implies removing cyanohabs from a water body and preventing their occurrence. Unless we are willing to undertake major efforts such as serious watershed management and includes global warming, the best we're ever going to be able to do is bloom management. And we have these lists of toolboxes that we can work with.